Okay, let's continue on. Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming, right? The coming, the parousia of the Son of Man. There's Son of Man again. Once again, this is Jesus' subtle way of, of reminding us, read Daniel. The Son of Man is all explained there. And then he says something very interesting. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Well, that is a very interesting uh, statement. It's almost like a riddle. Uh, yes, there are, there are scriptures in the Old Testament that address this, but I want to go to Revelation because that will give us both uh, what to see and the vultures. Revelations 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword which to strike down the nations. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. And then in verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that, were fly, that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And on the rest, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And this is all associated with, as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Next verse. Now he goes on and says, immediately after the tribulation, and what starts the tribulation, remember, is the abomination of desolation as spoken of in the prophet uh, Daniel. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then, another important word that transitions things, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. So immediately after the tribulation, we see this cosmic event, the sun, moon, and stars go dark. Okay, um, is this the first time we're seeing this? No, this is not the first time we're reading about it. This has been prophesied by prophets in the Old Testament time and time again. From the prophet Isaiah, chapter 13, verse nine. Behold the day of the Lord. And hopefully by now we know what the day of the Lord means in Old Testament speak. It is um, the second coming of, of Jesus Christ. It's the parousia, the whole um, uh, complex set of events that's gonna follow. Um, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. And in verse 10, we read, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. 
I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Ezekiel 32, verse 7. When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give its light. Let's read on in Joel 3.14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. This is the the gathering of nations in in, uh, Armageddon. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And then what happens? The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. He also mentions this in uh, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But let's go to Revelation 6. Um, The opening of the sixth seal. I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So this is the sign that we need to look out for. Verse 30, it went on to say, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the, once again, Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And this had already been introduced to us in chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 7, where it kind of gave a little executive summary of, behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on the account of him, even so, amen. And then in verse 31, and he will send out his angels, so and means while this is all going on, we see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, that's important, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. They will gather his elect. Now, this is usually interpreted um, to be the rapture, the resurrection. I say usually because, um, for example, amongst the pre-tribulation believers, uh, tribulation has already happened before any of this has gone down before any of Daniel's last uh, seven years in the 77s. Um, But Jesus speaks very plainly here. He will gather his elect. He will send out angels to gather his elect. And keep in mind that this gathering, this verse 31 is after verse 29, which means that the rapture occurs after the great tribulation, after the cosmic signs of the sun and moon and stars going black. Oh, and by the way, verse 31 comes after verse 30, meaning the rapture occurs after everyone sees the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Um, And let's read the Thessalonians account of this because hopefully this will help. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse verse 9 verses. Now concerning the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, let no one deceive you in any way. Or in Jesus' words, do not be deceived. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist is revealed. He's gonna set the abomination of desolation, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above 
against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That is the act of the abomination of desolation. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We're already seeing lawlessness uh, uh, becoming more and more evident in, in, our, in our world. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Puh, you're gone. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Remember, Satan is being released to do his damage to uh, God's chosen people with all power and false signs and wonders. Okay. First Thessalonians 4.13, Paul goes on to say, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have passed away before us, that you may not, may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord himself, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming, the parousia of the Lord will not proceed, will not go in front of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, now think of this, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of, of God. There's that trumpet again. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the air together with the Lord coming down with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Okay, now there's something else that I think is worthwhile. And let's compare this to the events that happened uh, with Jesus when he died on the cross. And this is found in Matthew 27. Now he's on the cross. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So from about noon to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, there was darkness, a cosmic sign. The sun was black. The moon was black. The stars were black. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabasani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then we read in verse 51, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And then listen to this. The tombs also were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And the coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And then there's nothing else recorded. So what happened? Well, I would say it's the first fruit of the resurrection of the dead, being caught up with Jesus. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Wow. Verse 32, back in Matthew 24. 
From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things that I've spoken about, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation, this generation that's experiencing these things will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He goes on, verse 36, but concerning that day, so now he's kind of circling back and wants to explain a little more about that day and hour, which no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as we're in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man. And then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. That's very true, but we do know the signs to look out for. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. And therefore, you also, we also, must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. So he's talking about the parousia. He's talking about the rapture part of the parousia. Um, that's not the end of the Olivet Discourse. He goes on now in, into some parables. The parable of the faithful and wise servant. Uh, where the servants are the religious leaders of that day and also of today. Uh, the parable of the ten virgins, which concerns a uh, relationship uh, with our Lord and Savior, and being prepared, having oil in our jars. There's the parable of the talents, of giving what is, of doing what has been given to us, which in one sense, it further explains uh, the parable of the 10 virgins. And then there's the sheep and goats, last part of Matthew 25. And as you read this, you start to realize that this is not a parable. This is once again, Jesus teaching, and this time he's teaching on judgment, the great white throne, and his rewards, which are found in Revelations 21, verse 1 and 7. So that's as far as we're going to go in the Olivet Discourse, at least for now. I want to read Zechariah, chapters 12 through 14, which concerns the day of the Lord, concerns Israel, concerns the new covenant. So without further ado, let's read this. Zechariah 12 and verse 1. <clears throat> the oracle of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding nations. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. So it's not only going to be Jerusalem, but it's going to be Judah. Verse 3, on that day. Now we already know what on that day means in Old Testament prophetic speak. It's the coming of the Lord. It's the second coming of Christ. It's the parousia. I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will, shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength 
through the Lord of hosts, their God. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves, and they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord will give salvation. This is the new covenant to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace, which we read about in the new covenant and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, who are we talking about now? This is not Yahweh. This is Yeshua. On him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn the Jewish people will be broken. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the house, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the house the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shemites by itself and their wives by themselves and all the families that are left, each by itself and their wives by themselves. So this is going to be, shall we say, personal conviction, personal weeping and moaning. Chapter 13, verse one. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. This is water that's cleansing the, the bride, preparing her for the wedding, right? The mikveh that we read about in the Sinai encounter. Verse two, and on that day declares the Lord of hosts, declares Yahweh, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, because you haven't done it, I'm going to do it, so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets. Remember, in the last days, what? There's going to be a lot of false Christs, a lot of false teachings, a lot of false prophets, and the spirit of uncleanliness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say, you shall not live for you speak lies in the name of Yahweh and his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he will say, I'm no prophet, I'm a worker of the soil for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks, what are those wounds on your back? He'll say the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Moving on. The shepherd is struck. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Who's that? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Against the man who stands next to me, declares Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. And what happened? Jesus was crucified and the children, the Jewish people were dispersed. They were scattered throughout the world. I will turn my hand against the little ones and in the whole land declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish and only one third shall be left alive. So when 
the dust settles, the day of the Lord and all that, there will only be left standing a remnant, a third. And you would think, okay, that's it. Now we can celebrate, right? No. Verse nine. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. And when, if and when they pass, they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord Yahweh is my God. Chapter 14, behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out to, into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward, the other half southward, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And then the Lord my God will come. There will be the wilderness encounter and all the holy ones with him. On that day, there shall be no light. So there's the sun, moon, and stars, cold or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at the evening time, there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern Sea, half of them to the Western Sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name, one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. And it shall be inhabited for there shall never again, never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. And on that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them so that each will seize the hand of the other and the hand of the one will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah is going to now enter into the fight. They will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments in great abundance. And a plague like this plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. We're now into the millennium and to keep the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Trumpets. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there should be no rain. There shall be the plague 
with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. And this shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. And on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. And the pots in Jerusalem of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall be no longer a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts. So Jesus is no longer going to be clearing out money to change your tables on that day. And that's the end of Zechariah's prophecy. Um, I'm going to finish with the end as prophesied in the last chapter of Isaiah. Chapter 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From the new moon to new moon and from the Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And they shall go out and look upon the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me for their worm shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So that's the end. Um, and what we will do, we will go from here to Daniel.